Wayne, are there some interesting things to do today? Questions? Yes. I will um, send around a note, an email to you, reminding you of the uh, kind of rules for the exam next week, week from today, um, which include the fact that you uh, don't need any calculators, you don't need a blue book. You, you will write the answers right on the page. There'll be space for it. Um, it's from 6 o'clock to 8 in various rooms of uh, the LSB. And uh, so come on time. <laughs> uh, eat, get a little rest. I will have a, a review session at this hour, 3 or 4. Instead of uh, new stuff, you can come at that time and ask any questions of me that you wish. Uh, you also have a couple of review sessions with the GSIs scheduled, which you're welcome to attend both, either one or both. Um, and that'll be kind of, a, mine will be a free for all. I'll have no specific topics in mind. You can ask whatever is interesting or bothering you. Um, so I'll send that around uh, tonight. Um, so, um, <clears throat> uh, okay, so going back to uh, this kind of ironic um, that just this week we are. Um, We are talking about electromagnetic induction, which is the means by which electricity is generated. And we talked about that on Monday. And as one of the more powerful demonstrations of the importance of electricity, we had a power failure at 5 o'clock, which knocked out the campus. So if you ever had to, uh, let's see, why we not? OK, so that was my opening uh, remark and talking about that electricity changed the world, our world changes dramatically if we lose electricity. I did not do that deliberately, that demonstration of knocking out the campus, that was not my doing, but it drove home the point very well. Um, so today, what we're really going to see is just how, how it's done. When they brought generators onto the campus, they brought six new generators. Let me get this one going. This is actually a generator. I can find the on switch here. Oh, here we go. I'll turn that on. It's going to warm up. It's a little boiler, which is going to create steam by and by. It's going to actually generate electricity for us. This is what's going on in some place far away where they generate electricity and send it to us. Uh, We'll also today have you generate electricity. Some of us tried that before. With this little thing, we're substituting steam or nuclear energy. We're going to have you all, each of you, will try this. I think it's a very most dramatic example of what electricity costs. If you try this, you see, you, we can turn this handle. And if I uh, close the switch, I can light a bulb here at the cost of my physical effort. <laughs> and I want each of you to try to realize just how much effort goes into doing that. We'll do that at the end of the day. I don't want to interrupt now, but maybe about 10 to 4, we'll stop talking. And I want you to come up and try that with your own hand. It's, uh, it's an amazing thing. <clears throat> so. Uh, but what, the theory of what's going on here was that you could explain this on the basis of um, the Lorentz force or the uh, Ampere force. What we're doing, we're turning a coil in a magnetic field. And so we have, say, a coil. And what you want to imagine is that there's a magnetic field produced by some big magnet. This is one way of doing it. You don't have to do it this way. You have a north-south. So the, your, your magnetic field lines B go across like this. And you turn this coil in the field. Now, there are electrons in the metal in this coil. And when they move with respect to the field, they represent, these electrons here represent a current. This electron here, as it's moving, it represents a moving electron in this field. So the, if you think of the, the edge of this wire like this, the electrons are moving this way with a certain velocity. And by the law of Lorentz, Q, B cross B, the fact that this moving charge is moving across the magnetic field, that we, we use our right-hand rule number two, or did I call it 3? I'm going to call it 3. Which is that you turn V into B, B cross B. And that will give you the direction of the current or the force that is being generated, which will be into the blackboard. Do we agree on that? You want to practice your, your, your right-hand rule? OK. In other words, v is, v is coming down. B is that way. So I have V going this way. Turn it. Wait a second now. V is this way. OK. And I turn this way. Ah, so no, in fact, it's coming, the force is this way. Am I wrong? V? If, I turn, if, my, if my loop is turning this way, the V is this way, right? Cross B, the current will be out this way, I think. The force of the current will be in that direction. OK? So the, what is going to happen is the current is going to flow around this. Well, let me distort this a little more like that. The current is going to flow out of this wire and into the circuit. If I attach a bulb to it, it will flow through the bulb and come around through here. So that's what, what drives current through this wire and into the bulb. So what you're doing, you're turning a loop in a magnetic field, and you generate that. Now, um, so we, we could derive this electromotive force from this argument, which we did. And we get what the electric field is. Um, from, from this by equating that force to the electric field that is, is thereby generated. And um, well, Q, that force is generated, the, these cancel out. So you get an electric field equal to V cross V. And the um, electromotive force is um, the electric field being the gradient of the uh, electromotive force. The electromotive force is E times L. I got that right side up. E L, right? That looks OK. Yeah, that's what I have. Oh, the notation here is a little bit screwed up. Uh, 
E is equal, that's the electromotive force. Is elect, yeah, I got, yeah, that notation is bad. That's the electromotive force. That last E should be a curly E. Okay, so we can generate electromotive force here. Um, this was fun before this thing boils over. It seems to have heated up and it's hissing. The T is almost ready. So let me let some steam out of this and it's going to start pushing pistons in here. There you go. And it lighted, I think you can see it's lighting up the bulb. If I turn off the steam, the thing doesn't go. So what all we're trying to do in power plants is to boil water. Uh, the nuclear power, you don't generate electricity directly from splitting atoms. What you do is you get heat out of the nuclear reaction. And that heat boils water, or it could be some other, well, no, it's typically water. It's why we very often power, nuclear power plants are near rivers or oceans, because they're actually putting the river through the power plant. Um, or, uh, yeah, so they sometimes use some other material to transfer the heat, like liquid lithium or something like that, to transfer the heat to the water. But basically, you need steam to drive a little motor. And then you get it. Now, the interesting thing is, if I don't generate electricity, take off the bulb so that the thing doesn't have any resistance, I don't know that you can hear that it's going any faster. I think you can hear it slowing down a little bit. It's, it's having a harder time generating because it's trying to generate power. I may be running out of water. <laughs> um, don't snicker with this thing. When you try it yourself, you realize that this little guy is it's a little engine that could. <laughs> All right, so that, that, this is your miniature power plant. You have to drive, drive um, a motor, which is turning, you see, it's a magnet here, and it's turning coils in the magnet. That's what it's doing. And then we pick the electricity off of those coils, and it drives the bulb. That's what's going on here. Can you, You'll come up later and take a look at this cute little machine. Okay, now, I'll turn it off. Hope it's working. Overdo it. Okay, now, the, 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 um, in, in doing things this way, you do have to be careful that there are two different kinds of motions involved here. One is the motion that you apply, which we, you will apply, to turn this thing. You put in that motion, and you'll find that what happens is that because you've generated a current here, there is a force acting. I'm trying to move this thing this way. That current turned into the magnetic field here. That I produces a, a force given by LIB, woman's lib turning it this way produces a force backwards. So I'm trying to turn it this way, but the current that I generate is acted upon by the magnetic field to resist the fact that I'm turning it. That is the cost of electricity, and the fact that this resistive force is opposing was emphasized by Lenz. Lenz is this way. <laughs> L-E-N-Z, yes, is that his name? No, no, L-E-N-Z is his name. So it's called Lenz's law, L-E-N-Z, L-E-N-Z. Lenz came up with this, and it's sort of reasonable by conservation of energy. If you're getting electric power out, you're lighting a bulb. You can't get it for free. You have to put in some work from the outside. So it, it just makes sense from the point of view of conservation of energy. Now, historically, Historically, somebody could have thought of this, just working from Ampere's discovery of the fact that wires produce magnetic fields and they have forces on each other. In principle, you could have figured it out. But the way it actually happened historically was that um, here's, here's this example on a large scale of the kind of turbine that we have here. There's a little turbine in here, which is being blown on by steam and is turning this uh, wheel. So, but on a large scale, it looks like that. It's very huge things. I don't know if you've ever been inside a boulder dam. They have here the, 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 the turbines are being tur turned by falling water, like a water wheel, water mill. Huge things, and the sound is, is deafening. If you ever go to Boulder Dam, go inside, and you can see this series of huge generators. Power is Los Angeles, part of it anyway. Part of Los Angeles. Los Angeles had grown since they built that thing. Okay, so what Faraday did, though, was he looked at it a different way. He um, realized the, the kinds of things that we showed before, that if you have a, a moving magnetic field or a changing magnetic field, that is to say, you have one of these loops, and you, you change the magnetic field passing through this loop. He didn't think of it, he didn't talk about it as always there's a force being generated, the fact that if I move the loop toward here, I have a moving current. He didn't think that. But what he thought was that he had a picture in his mind of field lines. And he said, well, if I move the wire, the lines are changing through the loop. And so that's a changing field that's producing the field. Or he had a second experiment here where he would have a circuit with a battery, and he would just close the circuit. So current would change through the first loop, and then he noticed a kick on the second loop. So again, there's a changing magnetic field, this time not due to moving a permanent magnet, but due to changing a, um, the current in the circuit. And that also, as you might expect, uh, produce, if that'll do it, this will do it, because this is a changing magnetic field too. But it's only when the current is changing. Once the current is steady, in, in, in a circuit like this, then you don't get any voltage generated in this, in this circuit here. So that's what, um, that's the key, the key idea, that you have to have a changing magnetic field. And I think we, we did a little bit of this. And by Faraday's thinking, you also get the direction of the, the field by the Lenz's law. For example, if I have a magnetic north pole moving toward this, let, let me, it's hard to represent this, why I brought this. If I have a, a magnetic north pole moving toward here, I'm actually increasing the flux through this loop. And, this, the, and it will generate a current in this loop, but the question is, which direction will the current go? Will it go this way, or will it go that way? And the direction that it goes is the way that will oppose the approaching magnetic north pole. That's what it has, it has to oppose it. So for example, what we have here, this is increasing. A north is coming, so I want to create a north over here. This thing has to create its own north pole to resist the oncoming north pole. See that? So which way would the current go? By right-hand rule number one, we want a north pole, namely current going, lines going out of this loop. So that means the current must be this way, right? So if, if the current is this way, then there will be north lines coming out of, of the loop, opposing the north pole. So the current, I don't know how to draw. Let me try to draw this bigger here and try, try to represent this here. The current will be coming, increasing here. So the current will be coming down this way, down this way through that, in order to create a north pole over here. And that will oppose the oncoming north pole. So that's how you decide what the current is. Again, this is Mr. Lenz, <coughs> always obstreperous. 
Um, now, um, the other thing that's important is that the amount of current, see, what, what, what Faraday's law says is that what you get is an EMF generated by, well, it depends on the number of turns that you have. I just had one here, times the change in the, the, the magnetic field times the area. This, this um, concept of a field times an area is something we saw before. We called it, in the case of electric field, we had an electric flux coming out of an area, and we defined the electric flux as uh, E times the area. Um, so here, uh, we, we have a similar idea. We have to um, uh, define the, the uh, radius direction of the area, but we'll keep it simple and just take B times the area. And so if you have this changing flux, either just to change the, the, magn the magnitude of B and A, the product, then you'll get, if it's changing, you'll get an EMF that is a voltage-like thing across this. So this acts like a battery, where current will be coming out of here and going into here. So this acts as though we're a plus terminal of a battery. This is like a plus terminal of the battery, and this is like the, mi the minus terminal. And uh, so the, but, but as with a battery, the amount of current that actually flows depends on the circuit to which it's attached, right? I mean, if you put a resistor here, for example, even if I have an EMF, the current that flows is equal to the EMF over the resistance. So if I have a highly resistive circuit, I'm pushing on it, but the current that flows is limited by the current. So th this is very nicely illustrated by this machine here. What it is, is um, it allows me to pass a current through uh, basically a strong magnet here. Now, when the current, let me try to show you what this thing is. It's kind of nice. It's a little impractical, but it's OK. Um, what, what we have is basically a magnet. We'll pass current through this thing, and we'll create a big magnetic field. And if I put a metal ring around here, this thing, when I click the current, this magnetic field will suddenly change. So I'll get a big VDT coming through the center of this thing. And it's going to respond. If the, if the flux is changing this way, it's going to want to make a flux going the other way. So I should maybe have a different one. This is the flux due to the current. See, the flux is going upward through. It's going to make current going downward through. It's going to fight the increase. So the current is going to be generated this way in that ring. And there'll be a north opposing the north. And so this thing will do, I'm going to click the current. And the north will be created here. And the north is over here. You, golden glove. Uh, no, so um, that's, the, the north cre is created by this click here. And um, it repels. Now, th this is copper. This is aluminum. It's a less conductive material. So it's regarded as a high resistance. Less current will flow through here. It'll make less of a north pole. So this one should not go quite as high. Well, let me be more dramatic. Let me try the lead. Lead is a pretty poor conductor. Didn't do anything. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> OK, so it's got a little warmer, though. This is bronze, which is also a fairly poor conductor. Let's see what happens. It's trying. Uh, it gets an E for effort. <laughs> Not very good. OK. Um, oh, and here's even the worst case. Uh, here's a ring with a split in it. So the current really can't get around. So it can't make a, uh, a loop. It can't make a mag magnetic north. Whereas without, without a cut, this aluminum does pretty well. With a cut in it, we predict nothing should happen, sure enough. Now, one of the tricks we can play, and this is interesting because we, um, uh, not to, we talk a little bit about the fact that resistance varies with temperature. So I'm, I'm going to lower the temperature of, say, the copper ring, because it really flies, and um, cool it down and make its resistance yet lower. So when, when we change the flux, the current that's generated should be more, because it can, it's less resistance. It should pop up even higher in, in principle, right? Do we kind of predict that? I'm advised not to grab this with my hands. <laughs> uh, yeah. Not to do, let it cook or freeze for a while. As I was saying, ah, OK. Maybe that's, oh, well, that's cooking, uh, freezing. Let's see if we can do a similar thing here. What we have is uh, little magnets. Whoop. And they're gonna, I'm going to turn it over, they're going to fall. Now, because they're falling, they're producing a changing magnetic field as they move. I mean, the field, for example, here, there's no field. And all of a sudden, there's a field. So there's a changing field here. So in principle, that changing field should induce a current in the rod that opposes the motion. Right? So if I do something like this, that one, and that one, they're all those identical magnets. But this is a non-conductor, so it doesn't generate, there's no, so much resistance in this rod that it doesn't generate any current in the rod. So there's no resistance. There's no opposing flow. That goes fast. Now, this is aluminum rod. Pretty good conductor, but not great. And so it does go slower. And this one is a quite a good conductor, copper. So when the magnetic field approaches here, then it makes a VDDT. Uh, it's, it's a pretty big opposing magnet as compared to uh, this guy here. So that's another demonstration. This guy should be as cold as he's going to be. Uh, OK, now stand back. Whoa! <laughs> I didn't want to catch it. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not 